All right, welcome back to ABA exam review. In the continuation of our BCBA practice exam series, we're going through another set of questions together and break them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass the exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. It is Chris's responsibility to pack his daughter's bag and water cup in the morning before bringing her to school. His wife reminds him, but he still always forgets the cup. Now his wife tells him to bring the cup and sets the water cup directly on top of the bag near the door so Chris sees it before leaving the house. Setting the cup on top of the bag near the door is a what? All right, so we're looking at the behavior of setting the cup on top of the bag. And what do we know about the context in which that behavior happens? Well, we know the wife wants Chris to bring the cup. His wife reminds him, but he forgets. So his wife first tells him to bring the cup, which is the SD. She then sets the cup on top of the bag near the door, which is going to be the prompt because that's what's going to remind Chris to leave the house. Then Chris grabs the house. So this is a good, a good indica indicator of what a prompt act, acts as. A prompt temporarily acts as the SD. D, right? Because the wife just wants Chris, when she tells him to bring the cup, to bring the cup. But for now, she needs to prompt him in order for him to remember. So setting the cup on top of the bag near the door is a prompt. Trish takes some data on how often a client bangs on the table throughout the day. Trish finds that the client bangs on the table nearly every 10 minutes for no apparent reason. If Trish wants to use non-contingent reinforcement, how should she set it up given this information. So when we want to use non-contingent reinforcement, we're going to set up a schedule for when to deliver that reinforcement. So the question becomes, what timing is that schedule on? Well, what you need to do is figure out how often the behavior occurs. And we found out the behavior of banging on the table occurs about every 10 minutes. So when we're using non-contingent reinforcement, we're trying to prevent the banging from happening. So we need to set our schedule just below 10 minutes. So A, provide reinforcement if the client does not bang the table every eight minutes. Now, what's wrong with A? Well, A is a non-contingent, right? There's a contingency. Non-contingent means no matter what, we're giving you reinforcement. Not if you bang the table, not if you don't bang the table, you're just getting reinforcement. B, provide reinforcement every 11 minutes, no matter what. 11 minutes is too long because by that time, the behavior's likely already occurred. Same with D, provide reinforcement every 10 minutes, no matter what. If you're doing it every 10 minutes, you are running a big risk on accidentally reinforcing banging the table. We want it at nine minutes, just right before the behavior typically occurs. We're trying to catch it before that behavior actually happens. So hopefully we can alter the motivation to engage in the table banging. Hillary received several comments from her clients last month regarding how excellent her service and her team has been recently. Hillary wants to highlight this on the company's social media, so she asked the client if its clients if they consent to writing a testimonial, which the clients agreed to do. Is this allowed? Okay, an ethical question, ethical question about testimonials. And the hard and fast rule for testimonials is you don't solicit testimonials from current clients. In Hillary's case, she received several comments from her clients about her excellent service, which is fantastic, but she cannot solicit those clients for those testimonials, even if they consent. It's just not allowed. So is it allowed? A, yes, Hillary obtained consent. Regardless, we can't get testimonials from current clients. B, yes, as long as it is the business website. Again, can't get current clients. C, no, you can never use testimonials. Former clients, you are free to use those testimonials. And then D, no, you cannot solicit testimonials from current clients. It's just not allowed. Conflicts of interest, door relationships, too many things can occur. So we cannot get testimonials from current clients. There are certain plants that are designed to grow in desert conditions. Over the years, these plants have developed resistances and defenses to the heat and the wildlife and the desert climate. What assumption is highlighted here? Whenever we're talking about assumptions, we want to be very specific. And you want to start to create little rules in your mind on how to identify the different assumptions. 
if we start talking about evolution or history of consequences, start thinking selectionism. In this case, you have plants that grow in the desert because over time, they've evolved to develop resistances and defenses in the heat and wildlife. So consequences have selection by consequences has taken place. The, pant, the plants that did not develop these things died out. The plants that did continued. So what assumption is highlighted here? A, determinism. Determinism says things happen for a reason. There's no argument against did something or did something not happen for a reason here. B, empiricism. Empiricism has us observing objectively what is occurring and taking place. We're not worried about being empirical about the plants developing resistances. We're not using data to show this. This is just what has happened. What we're highlighting is selection by consequences. The plants who develop resistance, resistances persist, and the ones who don't die out. And then parsimony has to do with the simplest explanation being the first explanation. We're not discussing simplicity here. We're talking about selection by consequences. This is why you have to be very precise in what the question is giving you, right? It's going to steer you in a direction for your assumption and dimension questions. Just go in that direction with the question. A new hire at Tandem Coffee Shop is learning how to properly make the avocado toast and the acai bowls. After the hire demonstrates competency and can follow the steps, the trainer starts to manipulate the steps so that the new hire has to adapt to the situation. What is the trainer using? Very straightforward chaining question. What do we know? We know the new hire is learning toast and the acai bowls. They can follow the steps in the chain. Everything is great. Now, because behavior chains and task chains are not perfect in real life, and the trainer knows this, they're going to manipulate steps so you have to adapt. In other words, we're going to break the chain or interrupt the chain. So what is the trainer using? A, forward chaining and B, backwards chaining. We don't know how the trainer taught, right? We just know the hire can now follow the steps. How they learn those steps, we're not sure. It's not really important, right? What about C, a limited hold? A limited hold says you have a certain time, time frame to engage in a step. And we're not talking about a time frame here. What we're discussing is an interruption strategy. Now that the new hire can do the chain properly. We're going to interrupt the chain to try to evoke new behaviors if somehow the chain gets interrupted in real life. Chloe takes her shoes off in the back seat and sticks them in her mouth while looking at her mom and laughing. Her mom takes the shoes away, which causes Chloe to cry, but Chloe also does not stick shoes in her mouth for the remainder of the car ride and the entirety of the week. Taking the shoes is a what? Behavior question, where do we start? We ask ourselves, did the behavior decrease or increase? Well, let's look. What behavior are we looking at? We're looking at Chloe. She takes her shoes off in the backseat, puts them in her mouth. Not very sanitary. What does mom do? In response, she takes the shoes away. What effect does this have? Well, Chloe stops doing it. The behavior decreases, so we know it's punishing. Now, Mom takes the shoes away, right? So we've got this negative, we've got this removal from the environment. So it appears to be negative punishment. So let's look at A, unconditioned punisher. Well, taking away the shoes is not unconditioned, right? That had to be, have, that's been conditioned through pairing one way or another. Automatic punisher. Well, it's not automatic because it's socially mediated, right? If there's more than one person involved, it can't be automatic. C, negative reinforcer. It is negative, but it's not a reinforcer because the behavior is decreasing. So taking the shoes has to act as a negative punisher. You're going to be able to, to do consequence questions very quickly with more and more practice. They become very, very simple and straightforward. People leaving grocery carts in the parking lot is a big problem for your local grocery store as the carts sometimes damage vehicles. Anytime an employee of the store sees someone return a cart, they are told to offer them a $10 coupon for use on their next visit. What type of reinforcement schedule does this resemble? A okay, basic reinforcement schedule question. What is the reinforcement of the consequence? You get a $10 coupon. Why? Well, because people leave grocery carts in the parking lot, so they set up a system 
where if you return a cart, you get reinforcement every time. So if we have a situation where every response is reinforced, what would we call that? A, a fixed ratio schedule. Yes, this is one, fixed, because every time you get reinforced. And two, it's a ratio because it's based on responses and not time. What about B, fixed interval schedules? Well, it's not an interval schedule because it isn't based on time. It's based on a response. And then C and D, this is not a variable schedule, right? Anytime. So this never changes. Anytime someone sees someone return a cart, they are giving reinforcement no matter what. So it is not variable. It's going to be fixed and it's going to be a fixed ratio schedule. Which of the following is not true about an abative effect? Well, we know an abative effect is associated with motivating operations, typically abolishing operations. An abolishing operation is going to decrease the value of a consequence, and therefore an abative effect is going to temporarily reduce behavior, temporarily stop behavior. Now, we're looking for something that is not true about an abative effect. A, an abative effect reduces the likelihood of current behavior. Yes, just like our earlier question, an evocative effect affects current behavior. Motivating operations affect current behavior. B, an abative effect is not a function-altering effect. That is also true. It is, not a, it is not permanently changing the function of a behavior. C, an abative effect is associated with an abolishing operation. Also true, the consequence value goes down, behavior tends to go down as well. So that leaves us with D, an abative effect reduces the likelihood of future behavior. A behavior analyst is working with the client to increase the rate of task completion. Initially, the client is reinforced after completing every five tasks, but the analyst quickly increases the requirement to 20 tasks before delivering reinforcement. Soon after, the client begins to show signs of frustration, avoid its tasks, and the overall rate of responding decreases. What is likely causing the client's decrease in task completion? So the question immediately is giving us the information that the client is no longer engaging in task completion, or at least has reduced their engagement. Why? What do we know about what occurred prior to the reduction? We know the client was being reinforced every five tasks, so some sort of FR5. I can draw an R. Now, the analyst quickly goes to 20 tasks. So we move from FR5 to 20. That's a 15 response difference. That's a giant response effort difference. As a result, the client engages in frustration, avoidance. Why? What do we call it when we thin a schedule too quickly? A, extinction. Now, you could argue, well, since we are no longer delivering reinforcement, the behavior is on extinction, but it's not extinction. It's not meant to be extinction, right? Because we are going to reinforce the client just after a lot more effort. So what's happening is what we would call ratio strain. When we thin a schedule too quickly, ratio strain is a possibility. We've got to be very systematic and smart about how we thin. Response cost is the negative punishment procedure where we are taking away reinforcement. Now what's happening here? And then a punishment effect. The better explanation rather than punishment is to look at a parsimonious explanation, which is we faded our reinforcement too quickly, which led to this ratio strain. Which of the following answer choices best represents operant conditioning? Now we know with operant conditioning, it's the SRS, right? And our consequence stimulus influences our future SDs and behavior. So we're looking for something with a consequence. A, a child starts to salivate when the classroom bell rings right before lunch. What well, we know, salivation is a reflex. That is an SR, right? Remember, op, uh, respondent conditioning is stimulus reflex. And that's what it is. Classroom bell rings, child salivates. B, a student starts to engage with peers more after their peers invite them to their house for the weekend. Perfect, right? The consequence is what? The student engages with peers more. And then what happens? They get invited to the house and now they continue to engage with peers. That's consequence maintained. C, a baby starts to cry when the parents leave the room, even though the parents are not reinforcing this behavior. Again, stimulus, parents leave, reflex crying, no consequence in sight. 
So the best choice here for operant conditioning is going to be B. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe on YouTube and share. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.